Hello? Hello, Bruce. Hi, yes. How you doing, Bruce? I'm doing all right. All right, great. Well, this is uh, Suburban Rebels broadcast with uh, Bruce Ravensmoreland of Wall of Voodoo, The Skulls, The Weirdos, Nervous Gender, and I'm sure more. <laughs> and I did one show with uh, with Lord's New Church on base, too. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, the the guys were in, uh, they were, uh, we toured with Lords of New Church for almost a year, a full year. So we were <clears throat> pretty much, you know, half their band would be in our van. I'd be, you know, we'd be in their van. We'd just switch vans and and stuff. Uh, we got, you know, we, <laughs> we got pretty close with each other. And I'm still staying in touch with Brian James a lot. But, um, oh, okay. but uh, I, uh, we, so they were in town, um, I don't know, it was probably like 1986, five, about 86, I think. And, uh, and, uh, they, they, but they didn't bring their bass player, Dave Traguna. They were just here for some publicity stuff, uh, with IRS records. And, and so was, the, 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 the club, the scream was going on then. And, um, and I said, Hey man, let's do a, let's do a, uh, Lords of Voodoo show, you know, the, you guys with the, me on bass, and and they said, hell yeah. So we did, we, you know, we we I think we did one Wall of Voodoo song, but it was mostly uh, mostly Lords of the New Church song and a couple other covers and stuff like that. And we played a yeah, we we played the the Scream Club, which was at the Berwyn Center in downtown LA. It was oh. pretty cool. Wow. And how how was playing uh, with Stiv? Stiv was great. Stiv was funny. He uh, they pulled they pulled a prank on he pulled a prank on me in uh, in uh, Northern England. Uh, we we were touring together and and I was uh, you know, I had it was you know I was like kicking dope or some of the time because every time we went on tour, uh, you know I was just trying to get off drugs and stuff. So I was like kind of in a bad way, and um, and I was like you know I heard they had you know. Aspen with codeine and stuff like that, and you know it's like pretty hardcore aspirin compared to what we have in the states. And so I asked the Stiv and them. Um, I was in their van, and we pulled into a drugstore, and I'm like, man, what do they got here? What's the strongest stuff they have in 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 England that you can get? And they go, just ask for Durex. And I go, and that's the extra strength. That that's tell them you want the strongest Durex they have. So. Um, I never heard of, you know, Durex. I just, you know, thought that sounds that sounds like a strong medication. So we're all in, in the drugstore and I'm asking the pharmacist, man, I really need the strongest Durex you got. And I just hear them all busting up behind the, the counter and it's like and I you know, Durex was a was a condom <laughs> brand that they did we didn't we didn't have here in the States back then. We do now, but back then we didn't. We just had Trojan and uh so <laughs> Pretty, pretty funny, <laughs> kind of embarrassing, but funny as hell. That's really funny. What? Uh, how wild were those shows that you guys played? Oh, they were they were wild. I mean, you know, the, the, those guys, <clears throat> those guys are pretty crazy. They, you know, and 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 drank a lot. I mean, I'm, I don't remember Steve drinking a whole lot, but uh, you know, I, I think he was, you know, probably doing a little bit of math. There's, some, you know, what this or sulfate, which is the English version of meth, but. You know, Brian and them were would drank a hell of a lot. Nicky, not so much. They they always called him, the, you know, the posh member that was like you know upper upper scale. The um, Nicky, the the drummer. Uh, mm-hmm. They always called him the posh one. So he took care of himself a little bit better than the rest of them. But but you know, uh, Dave and and Brian, they they you know morning till night with the Jack Daniels and and you know. Never a hangover if you, you know, get into the van after waking up in the morning and open the bottle of Jack Daniels. So, so yeah, yeah it, was, it hit it pretty hard, you know, everywhere we went. I, I was probably, you know, I was, you know, they smoke weed and stuff like that, but I was like, you know, I was definitely the hard drug guy of of the band. I was always into every town I went to trying to find, you know, who had heroin or whatever, you know, that was just my kind of, my yeah. thing back then. What, uh, was there any fights at those shows, the Lords of the New Church shows? 
No, I mean, you know, there would be arguments and stuff like that, but there was never any fight, no, no, no fisticuffs or anything like that, and and definitely not with us. I mean, I mean, at that point, we had our, our singer Andy Preboy, and uh, and and we all got along pretty pretty good, you know. There was you know a few little things here and there, but but no, I mean, if, if it was Stan Ridgeway, there might have been some fighting here and there amongst us, but but no, uh, uh-uh. yeah. <laughs> So let's let's take it back. How how did you first become like uh in the you know, punk rocker? Was it Alice Cooper and Iggy? Uh Alice Cooper was a huge one. I mean I, I saw the original Alice Cooper group, um and it was it was life changing. But even before that I there was a I think me and Mark were really into the what we, when we first got into music we were into, you know, Jimi Hendrix and the, you know, sixty stuff. But even more than than you know the more hippie stuff, we were in the Sunset Strip sound, like the electric prunes and the seeds and stuff like that, and Blue Cheer and and uh, and and MC5 and stuff like that. And and MC5 was actually one of our you know first records when we were kids. We saw it at the liquor store, which you you know our liquor stores back then used to be places you could get records at. And uh, we saw the MC5, bought it, and played this played the hell out of it for, you know, like a good five, six weeks until my, you know, me and my brother and my mom shared a room in my grandparents' house because we were very poor. And my dad left before I was born, so my grandma heard the song Kick Out the Jams, motherfucker, and she's like, what the hell? And she, she came in and grabbed it because I'm taking this back. How could they sell this to young kids like you? And we were so bummed out so which endeared us to to this to that sound even more so you know at that point we were definitely definitely into that kind of garage sound that you know the the more um the more feral kind of rock and roll and, and bare bones type stuff mm-hmm. so so um so you know we that's kind of what got us into it i think what what kind of that's what kind of you know got us towards the avant-garde or or not avant-garde. I would say the more punky type stuff that we were into, the more feral um, music that we got into. But um, you know, definitely band like Alice Cooper uh, got us into the more just you know you know just the branching out, the more experimental, the more theatrical part of it. Um, so, so that you know, Alice Cooper group was a, was a huge part of it, and then you know, and then later on, for sure, uh, you know, Bowie, Roxy Music, Bowie, some of, even some of the progressive stuff like Vandergraaff Generator, um, you know, that was coming out of England, really, really shaped us because you know at that point, then we were really playing instruments and trying to play our instruments well at that point, and uh, so I I think that that bands you know bands like like those really help help shape our you know the way we played our instruments like the thing mark really played a, played a lot like phil manzanera from from uh roxy music and robert fripp uh along with you know the, you know guys from you know elvis presley johnny cash and the twangy stuff like mm-hmm. that but but um so it was kind of a mix between americana and some of that you know, avant-garde, uh, ethereal British stuff coming out of there and coming out of England at the time. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of our, our early, early, you know, early influences in Wall of Voodoo were, you know, were definitely coming out of that type of stuff. Yeah. And, and you bought a bass and your brother bought a guitar or? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I, when we were playing really young, I was a drummer I was never really good at it, but but you know Mark was always the older brother, and I always listened to Mark, and so, and he uh, he said, "Oh Bruce, you know everybody in the neighborhood is either a drummer, or guitar a guitar player, or singer, so we need you to play bass." So he made me play bass. Mm-hmm. So we were really poor, and you know I, I feel bad about to this day, but we went to a music store, and I had we I had to have everybody distract the owner and I ran out the back door with a cheap ass K bass and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I, same thing for my amp. I went to another music store 
ran out the back with a, a crappy old uh, Fender uh, solid state bass head, and uh, and and that's how I got and started doing bass. And my brother t- sort of taught me just a little basic how to do, you know, how to practice finger exercises and stuff like that. And neither one of us ever took any any lessons ever. So. Um, you know, so I just started listening to the bass players I liked at the time, Dennis Dunaway from Alice Cooper, John Entwistle, um, you know, people like that and and just try to emulate, you know, very badly in the beginning, but but try to emulate what they were doing and just kept at it and uh and eventually got there. And then, you know, my brother was always you know, and then we when I was we were do, skipping way down the line here when I was in the weirdos and he was in the skulls and we were doing punk rock. Um, and he had an idea to do something more experimental, more like, po- when, you know, it wasn't called post punk, you know, but, but what became post punk, you want to do something different. You got a Moog synthesizer and he says, Bruce, you can't play bass now. Now you got to go to keyboards. And I, so I had to learn how to play keyboards. <laughs> So he t- he made me switch from drums to bass, from bass to keyboards, and then later on, you know, after he was gone, I switched to guitar and vocals. So, but I, you know, it's it's my brother was the one who got kind of got me all around the world on instruments, even though he stayed with guitar his whole life. Yeah, and you uh, you guys used to jam with uh, Killer Kane from the New York Dolls, right? Yeah, I had a. a when I was 15 and a half, I had a driver's permit. Maybe it was 16, but um, and I, I got this old Ford Econoline van that that um, you know I worked at, worked at a, at a job for you know uh, installing appliances for in West Covina where we did high school at and stuff and and uh, and, and I got the van and so we'd go out to Hollywood going to shows in the van and and seeing, you know, some really great stuff at the time. Like, you know, we saw a lot, you know, going to see the, the Starwood and the Whiskey to see bands like Slade and and Mott the Hoople and things that we were really into at the time back then. Uh, uh, New York Dolls, Iggy and the Stooges and stuff like that. And, uh, and, um, and then we ran into Lauren and uh, from the Dogs somewhere well we played a show as a sky it was our glitter space band called the sky people that we had which is our main band in the in the 70s um we were kind of um i don't know how to say it uh there's there's a band called zolarex that was kind of our rival band at the time in la but um we dressed in glitter stuff but we there was no stores that sold glitter stuff back then spires and mars were just starting to come out and you know they could get stuff like that in, in London, but not anywhere in the San Gabriel Valley outside of, or even in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So, in I, I was in junior high school, I think, and I made I tried to make platform boots and wood shop by getting some um, some a patent leather, red patent leather, and some wood, and then making a wedge out of the wood to kind of contour towards feet, and taking carpet tacks and Tacking the uh, the patent leather and to the to the to the base and and kind of wore those. So we kind of and then Mark had a girlfriend that made clothes, so we had her make us some glittery stuff. And uh, so yeah, we got our luck and our sound together doing glitter space stuff in the um, in the early mid seventies. And then uh, and then that was you know that was our, our and then. We played a show opening for one of Kim Fowley's bands. I can't remember which one it was. It was uh, maybe The Quick or something like that, mm-hmm. and uh, or The Runaways or, or, or something. And and the Dogs I think played on that show too. So the, and Lauren, we met Lauren from the Dogs, and they were from Detroit. And they they said they we just blew them away. They've never seen anything like us. So. They kept inviting us to come out to their place. We lived on a, at an apartment on Gower and Selma in Hollywood. And so I'd, we'd take my van out there, go hang out with them, sleep in my van. And then one day 
the van just kind of broke down in front of their place and we just so we kind of lived out of there and then arthur kane and blackie lawless lived next door to them mm-hmm. and then there was a then then next door to the other side of them was a, a passionate art studio which was a bondage and uh place where uh mm-hmm. bd and s and m place you know for the you go and pay money to to do that so mark's girlfriend at the time got a job there we started staying with the dogs and then they took us to the mask to meet brendan mullen which was the first punk club in la and they hadn't even done any shows yet there was just a rehearsal space so we met him we started talking about doing some shows and then in the meantime blackie lawless and and arthur kane loved mark's look and they tried to give him to play play guitar in killer kane Mm. And Mark, you know, try out a few times, but he, you know, he really wanted to do this punk rock thing. He didn't want to stay in this sort of long haired glitter thing. And, and he was just, he wanted to cut his hair and, and stuff. So, so he, he said, forget it. And he just cut his hair. We, we started trying to get a punk band together instead. And then, and then I moved down to the mask and became the, the MC for the mask with Brendan and started, you know, introducing all the first punk bands and then, you know, he got into the skulls. First, we, he played in the bags, and then he went to the skulls, and then I got into the weirdos shortly after, and, and that was our introduction to punk rock. And we did that for a few years until we thought that it was getting too stale and, and wanted to do something a little more interesting and, and conceived of as something like Wall of Voodoo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what what were uh like the early days of the mask and uh LA punk like? Uh it was well I mean it was literally there was like it was small. There was there was a very, very tight knit group of maybe I mean, usually about eighty of us, but you know, at the maximum if there if there was a big show there might be hundred and twenty five to hundred and fifty maximum people that were we could actually call punks. There was a few, some spectators and stuff like that, but there was just a handful of us, but we were so into what we were doing, uh, you know, and there was no, there was no clothing line. There was no places where you could go to get a look like ours. We just had to imagine our own life. We'd go to thrift stores to, you know, there was a place called Playmates down the street, which is a lingerie place. So we'd go to the basement at the, the out back and, like for shit that nobody wanted that there was just like, you know, just, yeah. just the most outlandish stuff that, you know, it's like, Oh no, we got to sell this for 99 cents. So we zone right in on that stuff and add it to our attire. And, and then there was the army surplus store we'd get stuff at. And it was, so our luck was really, you know, it was very crude at the time. Um, but, but, uh, you know, but we were just, we, we 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 had definitely had a luck and and uh and we got you know ridiculed walking down the street even hollywood boulevard people screaming things at us throwing things at us and and uh but it just all all that animosity just put us stuck us together like glue even even more and we all looked out for each other and yeah yeah and you mostly played uh you said with the skulls and the weirdos at the mask right yeah, yeah, skulls, weirdos. I mean, I I, I did a couple of shows with the controllers, and uh, and uh, I think we did a couple of things with Rick L. Rick from the Berlin Brats. We did maybe one show with them, um, but yeah, it was yeah that was mostly our our gig though was uh, was the me from the weirdos marking the skulls. Yeah. What, how was your experience with the playing with the weirdos and John and the Dick Brothers? I mean, Denny well, Brothers. So it's fantastic because they were they were them and the Screamers were <laughs> the biggest things in L.A. at the time. <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> you could probably add the Dickies and maybe X into it, but but uh, but the weirdos were even you know even predated those bands and. I mean the weirdos and the screamers. So um, the weirdos are definitely my favorite. So when David Trout, the bass player, uh, decided to just go off and be a teacher and and get out of punk rock, and they asked me to do it, I was like, I was like blown away. I was so so excited, and it was it was really fun. It was 
weeks. I had had a great time. Um, uh, you know, and I, you know, I definitely had some some issues of uh, mental health issues. Me, you know, me and Mark grew up not so great. Uh, um, you know, and, and some of the things we had to deal with a very young mom who was 17, 18 when she had us, an alcoholic, no dad, very poor, and um, and so there were there were definitely a lot of. And, you know, we had sexual abuse and neighbor that abused us. We were sexually abused when we were younger. So we had a lot of is- a lot of issues that we had to deal with. And, you know, and I had during those times eating disorders and stuff like that. And, and a lot of a lot of things I was working through that kind of kept me from being, you know, who I became much, much later in, in my life. But but um, there, all those demons I battled for for years and years and years, all, you know, basically almost to, almost till forty years old. But so you know, they kind of got in the way of, of of the fun and the excitement of and and of how far I could have took every every opportunity I got back then. But um, mm. but 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 still, the weirdos. It was it was great until it was until t- towards when I got out of it. Um, you know. It was, Mark was already talking about doing something different, like Wall of Voodoo. Some people were starting to say, you know, punk punk rock was kind of getting a little stale. Uh, mm-hmm. The beach kids, like Venice and Orange County, and uh, the kids were starting to get into it, and they're more violent. They they were more rigid in in what they liked, you know, what they did and who they accepted. Where the original punk rockers were just so eclectic and so accepting and and open to to you know gay people straight people ages colors races you know whatever and and they the this new breed was much more rigid in in their in in, in their what they would accept so it was time for us to get out and and then when and I kind of felt it in the weirdos, and you know, I think even they felt it that they needed to change, and I, and so I I just got out first. Oh, okay. All right, well. And how did you get your uh, nickname, uh, Bruce Barth? Well, that was we, you know, at the at the uh, mask when I was the MC for the mask. Oh. You know, everybody had a punk rock name, and you know, so you know, Bruce Moreland isn't so punk rock, and then. Uh, because of my eating disorder, I had sort of had bulimia back then, so I thought perfect Bruce Barr. <laughs> oh, uh, and so, how did you and your brother start Wall of Voodoo? Did you guys just like? Uh... Well, we were. I mean, we were really. Mark was really into Eno um, and what he was doing with Robert Fripp at the time, and uh, and craft work. We were both into craft work and stuff like that. So we were talked about doing something different, like you know, with keyboards, but he worked a job for for a summer and was able to save up to get a, a Moog synthesizer, and that just changed everything because, you know, they weren't cheap and, and not many people had them. So, mm-hmm. so that synthesizer basically changed the course of our life. Um, and then that's when he said, oh, can you, Bruce, I need you to play the, you know, play the keyboard. So, so, you know, there was a happy medium. I played half the songs in bass, half the songs in keyboard. Okay. In the beginning, it was just a three piece. It was, and he found he Stanbridge, what he already found in a band called Model Citizens, who practiced down at the Mask. And I thought they were a little too jokey or a little too corny, uh, you know, for 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 what I like. But Mark's like, ah, no, it's, it'll be fine. I want to, you know, an anti singer singer, somebody who's, you know, wouldn't be, you know you wouldn't even think about having as a lead singer. So, so said, okay, well, let's do it. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and just started working it out. And right at the time we all lived in an office, one office without a bathroom, just a sink in it, a uh, small, probably about 130 square foot office on Holly Boulevard across the street from the mask. And it was me, Mark and Joan and Nini who, or later it would be Joan and Nini, but it was our rehearsal space and recording space and me and mine and Mark's living space and also and then later on it'd be Joan and Nini's living space too. So so we all started, you know, writing and we got a uh 
we we got a key a Sony two track tape reel to reel tape recorder and started recording all the stuff. In fact, all the early Wall of Voodoo, you know, songs that are between songs, little excerpts and stuff like that were all done on those. And 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 some of our and our first album was so hard to do because we got this great ghost in the machine compression compression by bouncing tracks on the Sony two track. You every t- you know, you only have two tracks and after you have you you do two tracks, you have to bounce those two tracks down to another track so you get the third track to play to and then on and on and on and by the time you got four or five, six tracks down there, you've compressed the first two, three, or four tracks down so much that that you just get this whole weird ghost in the machine vibe from it that you didn't start with. And, and we kept trying to recreate that when we finally got, you know, Phil Culp came on with index records and wanted to get us a little bit higher and studio, you know, eight or 16 track studio. Mm-hmm. And we just, we just, we were never satisfied. So we ended up using a lot of those two track recordings on some of the records. Yeah. Uh, and what about the name of the band? Did it come from uh, Ridgeway's friend? Or uh, yeah, you know, and and I can't even remember who the hell it was actually. Uh, um, some say it was I, you know, I thought it was Joe Ramirez uh, from The Eyes, and that's what I thought for a long time. And then somebody later on says, no, it was me and Gaza, Gideon, and and a few other people. But all I remember is that we were sitting around tr- thinking of name after name after name, and we're like, "Well, what do we sound like?" And 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 you know, Phil, we were thinking of Phil Spector. It's like that we have this wall of sound because we've got the, you know the the rhythm machine with the um, you know the African and Congo beats on it and Latin beats and stuff like that, and we've got the synthesizer, the bass guitar, the guitar, and. and Oregon and stuff like this and so it just was like a wall of sound like like the Phil Spector's wall of sound but with the African beats it was like wall of voodoo so it was perfect and we said well it's a wall of voodoo yeah. and I, and that stuck oh okay that's cool and what did Los Angeles influence you think the lyrics and the songs at all absolutely yeah it was Los Angeles at the time was Kind of it's you know desolate, scary. It was dingy. Uh, people didn't want to go there. If you said you lived in L.A. or Hollywood, it's like, ugh, God, why would you want to live there? It was, you know, the drugs and hookers and you know, transvestites and 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 all the stuff and, and and factories of long ago that had moved out and and office buildings that were no longer in use and it was. You know, it was, but it was cheap and 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 it was great for you know for musicians to get together. We could have you know we didn't have to work our asses off. We could just kind of squat places and and pay two couple hundred dollars a month rent from and these horrible little places to stay for um, and 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 but and it lent itself to us to be able to create and not have to work and you know, do nine to five jobs and stuff like that. So, um, uh, but it, yeah, so all our lyrics were really LA based. A lot of it was, you know, we, we, we hung out at the racetrack a lot because our minor Mark's family, our mom, our grandparents all worked at Sandy and the Hollywood park racetrack their whole, whole life. We worked there. So a lot of the stuff was, you know, centered around, Figures that the, from the racetrack, sh- shady, you know, gambling types, and and you know, uh, desolate factories, and just just you know, broken broken dreams, which was you know kind of Hollywood, you know Hollywood that all these you know people that came there and then found out it was just not what they it seemed to be, and ended up on the streets and hooking and hustling and and doing drugs and and so yeah, that was a the basis for a lot of our lyrics and sound and style back then. Yeah. And what were early uh, Wall of Voodoo practices like? Um, long. We, you know, back then you didn't have pro tools or you couldn't email files to anybody and stuff mm-hmm. like that. You couldn't, 
um, you know, you didn't have a way at home to sit there and play the beats and, and all these little virtual instruments that you could do and experiment with. So if you wanted, uh, if you wanted to, pull, you know, write a song, you had to have, you know, you could, you could get your bass line and stuff like that and maybe a beat on the rhythm machine, but, but you'd have to get, you know, I'd have to get my brother Mark to play like a counter melody or get the guitar going or his ideas to that bass beat. And then the keyboard had to find a way to layer it. And then, and then once you get other pe- people involved, then they, they don't want to do just the one thing you did. They're like, well, what if we did this? So you have to experiment with that. And if that doesn't work, then you have to go on for, what about this? Somebody has another, and then you just play that until you see if it works or if it doesn't. So, songwriting was you know could take two three four five days and then you know just to get the bare bones and you spend another two or three weeks you know kind of really honing it in and developing it and so rehearsals were often eight hour a day five six day a week things and then you just you know go out and 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 do stuff at night and then and then be back at it the next day after you wake up and you get right as you wake up and we woke up right in the same place we recorded and 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 practiced so so you just grab your instrument and start working on the thing you left off of the day before so it was not like it is now that's for sure yeah what about our early shows that you guys played How yeah early shows they were they they were fun i mean what was fun the very first show we ever played at was uh the a mask uh benefit show that we uh it was the cramps the um what's it the cramps uh it was pure health from from uh dc it, um uh, the dead boys uh God, I can't remember who out the plugs. I mean, it was a, it was just an amazing bill. But yeah, we so we just we just we didn't. We was just me, Mark, and Stan, and we had Brendan Mullen play drums. Who you know, who was not very good on drums, but we had to have somebody. And yeah. we so we did played our played our five songs that we had together back then, and people loved it. And I was like, what? I, I couldn't believe it. It's like, wow. This is it. maybe we have something here, so um, so we from that point on. I mean, every, it seems like in, no matter where we played, we we um, we was full and people were there and they loved it. I mean, it was it was it was fun. I mean, we were just we were pretty much a headlining band from that point on. Yeah. What What was your favorite uh, club to play in LA? Um. Oh dear God, there was. Uh, there was a place called Blackies that I'd love to play at because it was uh, it was just tiny and it was you know it was cheap it was tiny it was outside of Hollywood it was more down by um, Pico and La Brea and not much was going on down that way so you just felt like you could get away with more and and uh, and that was always a fun a fun thing I always liked the Hong Kong Cafe. Mm-hmm. And Chinatown was was a really fun place to play, uh, and then it was you know great if you could play the whiskey, but that wasn't all the time back then. You know they they they, they were still doing mostly you know rock and, and metal things back then, but but we could get in there every now and then. That was really fun, and and uh, but yeah, mostly I mean, Black East, Hong Kong Cafe, and the Al's Bar in downtown L.A. Those were definitely three of my favorite places. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what, what what changed when uh, Mexican radio became like a huge hit on MTV? Well, th- th- for me, it was it, see, I I, I was um, I had a falling out with Stan right during the recording of that album, and and I kind of left, uh, mm. you know, in the middle of that, and so, and then I and then and then I went into a, a psychiatric institute. Uh, in at UCLA um, for a good six months or so, uh, mm. when when that when that when that was released, um, because I was, finally had to deal with some of the demons that were that were killing me, 
Mm -hmm. uh, back then. And um, so, so when I heard it, I was in the psychiatric Institute and, and, uh -huh. and I heard Mexican radio. I was like, Oh shit, no, you know, fine. They're going to make it now. Of course. When, when yeah. I, uh, when I, when I had to do my exit and, uh, and uh, you know, so, I mean, so I had mixed, definitely had mixed feelings about it. And then, and then the, the, you know, like then I, saw that I didn't have any credits on the record, even though I know that I, uh, that I wrote, started the the song Call the West that the album was titled after. I wrote the, the main theme for that and a couple other things that I had my hands in that I never got credit for. So I was very upset about all that. Mm. And then, um, you know, and then soon after that, uh, you know, the, that came out, they did one tour and nobody could handle Stan anymore. And Stan thought he was too big for his britches. Uh, even though me and Mark were the definitely the main songwriters of the band. I mean, Stan definitely wrote a lot. He was really, he was a he was he was a prolific. Um, but his writing style was definitely different, and um, and a little more quirky. Um, where me and Mark were a little more animalistic, maybe a little more soul, I'd say. Um, he was more clinical, but, but all of that worked in the beginning. But I think he thought that he could take just his aspect of Wall of Voodoo. And, and that was, you know, he, he started believing the press that it was all him. And then, so he did something with, you know, the big heat with Stuart Copeland and thought, Oh, that's it, man. I, I don't need anybody. So he went on to do his own thing and, and uh with very limited success and then and then and then I rejoined the band um at that point. Um mm -hmm. and uh and then when got and I met Andy Preboy and, and Ned Lucart and got them involved and, and we you know started working on Seven Days of Sammy's Town, which I, I feel like is Ball of Blue's best album actually, um that and Dark Continent, but yeah. Yeah. And and so uh, did Ridgeway write Mexican Radio? Uh, he wrote. The, my brother came with the title and and the and the uh, and the song, I believe. I you know he wrote the music. Definitely wrote the music. You know, Stan might in the do 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 that hook line, but mm -hmm. the the song was that was was already. My brother had already written the pretty much the full song um, and the title, and then and then and then. Uh, Stan put all the bells and whistles on it. Do you know what inspired that song? Like, come about? Yeah. Well, it just, I think it's just from, uh, you know, they just, we used to like spend a lot of time in Tijuana, you know, going and, and going the horse races up there and just get, you know, hanging out into the bars and stuff. And it was pretty desolate back then. It wasn't like it is now. Um, and, uh, pretty stark difference between the uh one side of the border and the other but um so i i think it was just in being over there and just listening to the radio and just going shit i can't get a goddamn thing anybody's saying but you know this is what we this is what i got you know so I just felt kind of writing a song about that okay well what inspired call of the west um you know i i can't speak to that i mean i know i wrote some of the melody and uh to, to that some of the, the the music to that but i i don't i wasn't there when stan was com coming up with lyrics for that so I, I can i can't speak to that how did you come up with the melody for it like it's just well i don't you know it's just the way we always did it back then we would just start find a groove like a, a bass riff or a keyboard riff and uh and then somebody would layer it with something else and then we just keep going on it and until we we got you know until we got something we liked and when and then you know and then that's kind of about where I got to with Call of the West and 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 then I left before some of the other changes were done on it so so yeah I mean you know I can't really speak to that other than just how we usually yeah. wrote songs back then just someone would come up with a, a great line and go oh that's great just keep doing that and I'll come up with something to, to counter that you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was it probably the same process for Ring of Fire, right? With all the crazy. <clears throat> yeah, R Ring of Fire was that's you know kind of Mark got that that synthesizer, and then we got this little sequencer to go with it. That and it, and I started having a bunch of fun with that, 
And so I came up with that. Doo, 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 doo. I go, this is great. I want, and Mark started come up, you know, playing around. It was like, what if we used, we were just like, you know, drinking one night or something like that. What if we, we made that ring of, did Johnny Cash's ring of fire that like, fuck, let's try that. <laughs> so we just started doing the riff and stuff like that. And then, then Stan was like, well, yeah, fuck, let's do it. Let's try it. So he did the lyrics to it and, and, and and that just took off from there. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, and did you guys you guys played with Devo a lot? Were they like? Uh... Yeah, they they were big fans of all of it. In fact, I you know I you know, forget. And then I was at uh, the Cruel World Festival here in L.A. a couple of years ago, and and I was walking around backstage, and they were you know they ran up to me. I didn't think they even remember me after all these years, and. They go, oh my God! We just want to say thank you for for what you did in Wall of Voodoo, and we were such huge fans and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, you got, yeah, of course. Well, we were huge fans of you, yours. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what I remember one time when they first made it, and they did, um, uh, you know, when they first, I can't remember what album that is, what they you know, had the yellow outfits and the red and planters hats and stuff like that. Freak with Detroit. Um, yeah, yeah, freedom of choice. So that just came out, and they were, you know, we, they, you know, they just got huge. And I was, you know, friends with, with Mark and and Jerry and some of the other ones back then. And uh, and they said, you know, they got, you know, said, come see us at the, at the Santa Monica Civic. So I said, okay, yeah. So I'm back there. I'm backstage, and and the curtain. They had curtains back then, and. And he's Mark's like um, we're get, talking about our Moog synthesizer. He's talking about these modifications he's made to his. I'm like, wow, that sounds great. He goes, oh, c- come out here. So he sh- we go out on stage and he's showing me the back of this uh, this Moog and all the modifications he's made to it. And all of a sudden the curtains come up and it's like, you know, they thought that that you know he was out there because Devo was starting, mm-hmm. and so. There I am on stage with Mark, <laughs> both of us leaning down, looking at the back of the Moog, and I ran off, and they, and they started the set. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, what about the video for uh, Far Side of Crazy? Where was that filmed? The, the Vasquez Rocks uh, up there in, uh, in uh, just sort of out there by, uh, you know, by near Lancaster in California. It's a little kind of uh, north, northeast of downtown of of L.A. by it's a couple hours drive, or like hour and fifteen twenty minute drive, and it's a park a park. They've done a lot a lot of filming there, so we thought it'd be a great spot. They do a, they you know did all the Lone Ranger shows there, and we thought it has a kind of a a alien but western landscape. So we decided to go out there to to, to film it. Okay. And what about uh, Do It Again? That was, uh, how fun yeah. was that? Oh, that was really, really interesting because that was in the height of Brian Wilson, you know, craziness when he had the uh, the right. the doctor that was using him and telling him what to do. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't believe he agreed to come be in, the, in it. And so we would had him there and his doctor would tell him what to do and everything to say. But he was such a sweetheart. It was so great to work with him. And then, you know, Steve Sadian, who had done, you know, Far Side of Crazy, he also did Mexican radio um, video. Um, he 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 hooked it, hooked it up and got him over there. And uh, and then we made this like crazy kind of you know uh, post apocalyptic set design that or. Avant garde post apocalyptic set, and it's just it was just so surreal, but it was really fun though. It's a really fun video to do. Oh, cool. Uh, and uh, what did you write anything for Wrong Way to Hollywood? Um, I had, yeah, I mean, I, I know that like the the do 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 do, you know, some of the the the, the base, the chunky bass line that plotting baseline that goes to it but but um uh yeah it was me mark uh andy and and everybody it was uh but but i'm uh i'm gonna say you know i'm gonna give andy and mark most of credit on that song though yeah do you know what inspired it or 
Um, I think it was just, you know, Hollywood, the bar scene that we were going to, and we were, you know, just, uh, yeah. again, it was that, that, that concept that I was talking about where people come to Hollywood, think that they're going to be, you know, te- television stars, actors, actress, writers, or, or whatever. And, and, uh, and it doesn't work out for them. So, so they, you know, they take a wrong turn or a wrong way to get there. And, and, and that's kind of, you know, that, that was kind of a theme that we had in so many songs for Walla Voodoo. Oh, okay. So how did you get your nickname, uh, Ravens? Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was doing so this the band Ravens Moreland that I do I I wasn't supposed to be the singer I was just supposed to be the bass player I was uh back in early, late 90s early 2000s I was uh trying to get a, a a thing together that was more like maybe ministry or something like that uh maybe you know Danzig ministry kind of a little heavy but um slightly industrial but not really the industrial uh and and so i met the i met this drummer who could sing and a guitar player who was into the concept of what i was doing and we started this band and we had a, i can't even remember we had a different name for it um but anyways it was the beginning of you know myspace was just coming out we all you know had myspace pages and and stuff and then we and then i had this friend uh uh, david uh uh crap i'll think of the name later but this friend who had a a recording studio and he um he wanted some work done at night you know i was you know out of after i you know my heroin days i got clean in in late 90s and and uh I needed a trade. I was, you know, there was no uh, money in music and, and stuff. So I started becoming a Harvard flooring contractor or doing hard flooring. And then I became a contractor, got my license. And, but then I wanted to get back into music too, because I wasn't using drugs. I I could finally be back into it and, and not be destructive about it. And, uh, so that, you know, I got the concept, you know, for that kind of band and started working with these guys uh and then um i was doing some work for a guy with the, for the great recording studio oh uh, david bianco is his name and you know he did like ozzy osborne's blizzard of oz he did you know full mood madness for uh he was the engineer for for um for uh you know tom petty he did he just did incredible stuff he did some of the early Danzig records and stuff like that. And, uh, and so it was this great opportunity to have this engineer in this amazing studio record us. So we got some songs together and literally three and a half weeks before we were going to go into that studio, the drummer and guitar player see each other's Facebook pages. Well, the drummer, you know, I didn't know anything about these guys personally, the drummer, is a Christian, the guitar player ended up being a devil worshiper. They see each other's pages and they have a huge fight and they just, they can't work with each other. They both leave. And I was like, fuck all y'all. So, so I rewrit some of the, written some of the songs that they had parts in and added other songs and then wrote lyrics and, uh, and started and, start practicing singing really fast i i did three weeks and and i did i went in there and i with all new songs and played down all the ins, instruments i a friend of mine Jer, jeremy and a uh, few other guys came in and played some guitar with me but i you know i played guitar i played bass got a i did get a drummer and and i sang and i and i was the first time i ever sang in my life i didn't even sing background with wall of i never sang anything in my life and in three and a half weeks i did force myself to be a singer and i wasn't that good but you, know, you can tell in the first two couple of records but there you know there was parts that were okay i had a style it was like kind of like lou reed ish kind of sound style um and uh so you know but so by the second album you know i 
by the second album I'm I'm just I'm just fully into the, my new role of singing and playing guitar and uh or actually I was singing and playing bass at the time and then we couldn't the, I was sick of the guitar players one was you know drinking too much and stuff like that and uh and so I just you know kind of stripped the band down and I went over to guitar and singing plus the guitar was easier to sing with because you're not you don't not encounter rhythms like you do on bass. So, mm. so I trained myself to go to, to do guitar and singing, and uh, kept going with that for several years. And, and now, at this point, all these years later, you know, I've, I'm actually a really good singer, and and I play a lot of instruments. You know, do the keyboard and stuff like that. But I do have a co-lead singer, a uh, female named Christine Lanise, who's an amazing co-lead singer now. Uh, drummer Linda Lesaber, who played with Death on um, Death Ride '69 in my life with the Thrill Kill Cult, and a keyboard player named Liz Rhodes. So it's you know me and three girls, but it it works really well. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's how the, all that came to be. Okay, and and you put out I know eight records already. Yeah, yeah, uh huh. And uh, and so we got what, another one coming out in uh, in October, late October, I think. Oh, cool. And uh, what do you think inspired like most of those albums and the music you write these days? Uh, my, it, you know, a lot of them reflect back on the time when I was living on the streets, selling, shooting heroin, uh, you know, running with gangs to try to get by. And, and I mean, it was really bad in the nineties. I was, you know, I spent time in, in jail. I spent, you know, I did a six month, period i did a one year period i did a couple of three month periods in la county jail um just from from the the heroin and i was desolate i lived i lived on the streets i didn't have a roof over my head i was i was homeless and i sold balloons of heroin out of my mouth to the cars that would just drive up on you know eighth and, and broadway in downtown la back in the in the late 80s and early to mid 90s and and then I was always getting busted, and then you know I was even sh- you know shoplifting and getting busted for that when I couldn't mm-hmm. need to get a fix and stuff. So so um, so a lot of my lyrics draw from some of my experiences during that time. Um, I say a good a good deal of them, and then others uh, lyrics in these, these days are from stories that uh, true stories, crime stories, and stuff like that. And, you know, bizarre crime stories and occult, you know, things or the occult mm-hmm. killings and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what do you think the wildest weirdo show was? Oh, wow. Wildest weirdo show. Uh, well, I, I there was this one at the Stardust with the Club that was uh, – with the screamers and the weird that might have been my first show to me that was just wild it was and it was just the bill was amazing it was the screamers the weirdos uh can't maybe the germs and stuff like that but it was just packed it was out of control it was sweaty feral um it was just a crazy good um show and i remember it was it was just pouring like for a week straight in LA. It was like streets were flooded and stuff like that. It was, it was, you know, kind of surreal, but it was, it was a, just an amazing show. Mm, okay. I'm, I met you at the weirdo show in San Francisco last time. Oh, uh, right. Dicks. Yeah. We're there. Yeah. Yeah. Rest in peace, Dicks. I know. I know. He, it was, I love Dix because he he reminded me so much of my brother Mark and I, I, who I lost and then and Dix is just like him he was soft spoken quiet shy um, sweet um, but stubborn just like my brother and 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 talented and and a great writer and and uh, so losing him was it hit me just like almost like it did my losing my own brother. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. What do you think the wildest Wall of Voodoo show was? Huh. Well, I'll tell you, it wasn't wild in maybe a good way, but it's one of the wildest ones is we, uh, when we played 
when you know Stan was in the band and we played um we opened for the damned at the Lyceum in London and it was you know the just you know the the dam had just reformed after Brian James left and they did like you know the black album and uh and they were they were using keyboards at that time and they were this was their first show and <clears throat> with the kind of this new lineup with more keyboard oriented stuff so we opened for them and the, but the crowd was all just their just staunch staunch mm-hmm. punk rock kids that just wanted the punk rock um and so you know so they you know we come out there and we get they see all the keyboards on stage stuff like that and like boo boo spitting oh. on us i think stan got a, a boogie right in his mouth while he was singing and it made me kind of laugh though but <laughs> But uh, that was that was crazy. But I remember, you know, after the show, being backstage, and you know Jeffrey Lee Pierce being back there with us, and and uh, and uh, meeting a lot of a lot of uh, you know a lot of Londoners, you know, you know the damn people and all that stuff. And uh, it, it was so that was that was a crazy show. Okay. Yeah, but we kind of won them. Over. The, the one thing that I do remember is by the last couple of songs, we had finally won them over from the booze and the spitting to some, some, you know, definitely some applause and and cheers. Oh, <laughs> and uh, did you guys ever play with the Gun Club? You know what? I don't, I don't remember ever playing with the Gun Club. I think we did, but I can't remember. Um, the, because during the time of the Gun Club, it was that kind of cowpunk time, and 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 there was sort of the time that Stan left, and then and we were kind of reforming with An- with Andy. Uh, so so we there was a period of inactivity like eighty two, eighty three to late eighty four when they were really sort of taken off. Um, and then by the then when we got you know put our album out and stuff like that we were we were spending a lot of time in Europe and 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 stuff like that so I I don't really remember if we played with Gun Club but my memory is kind of shot anyways from all the drugs and stuff but they were a, a a band that we we loved and we we were very good friends with all the members and stuff like that so it, I'm sure it had to happen at some one point. Yeah, and uh, well, you got you guys did play with the Cramps, and uh, I don't yeah. know how close you got to Lux, but yeah, I mean a, a little bit, and and you know later on, I I you know he remembered me more than I remembered remembered meeting him, but that was so always the way things was. Everybody remembered me more than I remembered them because I was so preoccupied with you know whatever whatever disease I had going on at the time in my brain. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what does punk rock and new wave mean to you? Uh, well, punk rock and new wave. What does it mean to me? It it, it meant it, to me. It just meant a a stripping down of the of the titles. You know, like it's it it took the titles away from uh from the people who felt entitled to have the titles. The the big company, the, the big record conglomerates, the record companies, and stuff like that. The people mm-hmm. that kind of were just homogenizing music at the time. It, 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 it just said, you know, it said it shine. It took the spotlight away from them and put it on the kids and the people that were actually living rock and roll and 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 you know and and deserved you know, to deserve more recognition that than we were getting. So so to me that it was kind of a just a taking the, the title belt away from the from the entitled. Yeah. Okay. And uh if you could say anything to your brother again, what would you say? Oh just, you know, thank you for your genius and 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 thank you for your your time you know, thank you for your mentoring for me and and everything you you gave me in, in this world as far as you know direction and, and all that and 
and I wish you were here right now playing with me. We'd be doing definitely be doing Wall of Voodoo reunion shows at festivals and stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, you have any last words? No, that's it. I'm probably that that's about my brain's probably scrambled as, as I can get it right now. That's about all I can think of. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you very much. Have a great night. All right, you too. Bye.